Hello and half day, everybody. Welcome to KUM Reporters Journal. I'm Jason Salas. Thanks so much for checking us out right here on YouTube and the KUM Podcast Network. If you're listening to us on SoundCloud, the voice jumping in momentarily is going to hey. be... And there he is with, with a man who truly needs no introduction. And even if you tried to give him one, he's going to jump in. Uh, the very well-known and very popular, uh, very well-experienced, I should add, Chris Barnett, who is the subject of today's Reporters Journal. Right. I used to be well-liked. Oh, well, you know what? We're going you know, I wanted to talk about that, my friend, yeah. because I actually wanted to talk about the evolution of your career. You know, the fact that you started out doing, you know, radio comedy. You're actually a sports writer, which is how I became a fan of yours for many, many, many moons ago. Right. Uh, and now you're doing hard news. But, you know, before we get to that, I want to talk about something that's a little bit more pertinent because of recency. Um, recency. Yeah, there you go. See, you you, you wrote. You wrote, well, sounds legit. You wrote small, terse words into really malleable <laughs> articles and everything like that. I just used those vocab for college yeah. words that, that basically did nothing for Recency. me. Recency. Yeah. Okay, so recently right. uh, you had what a lot of people are saying is like not one but two landmark interviews, and you just basically went out on the street, shot them almost documentary style with your iPhone, and you got one, one gentleman, his name is Henry, right? Henry Crudup, we've learned since, is his, uh, is his last name. Thanks, thanks by the way, to, um, uh, to Will for actually posting that documentary film by a local production company who actually did a uh, backstory on him. That was very insightful, very wow. helpful. Good production, too, by the way. Nice. Outstanding stuff. Uh, so you got Henry on his plight, and then you also went downtown in the capital of Agatha, and then you got a couple viewed more in combined than 60,000 times, hundreds of comments, tons of shares and everything. Everybody's putting emoji. What was interesting, too, is because I'm a... You know, I'm a social media geek. Not one person used the laughing emoji for the for the couple and everything, which shows that they, they genuinely you know, felt the gravity of of the emotion of the story. And you, so, how was that for you? Actually, being there, you know, not setting this up. It wasn't a big, you know, full blown production, everything like that. Just walking up and having a conversation with people. I think it's just one of those stories that really uh, sells itself. You know, I mean, um, it's amazing to me how small Guam is and how often we see these people out on the streets i mean you see these people a few times a day not just once in a blue moon and so being somebody who sees them a lot i always wonder like hey what's that guy's story or hey what's the, what's the deal with these this couple out here on the streets or you know what why is this guy asking uh for money people wonder and so i feel like when you go and interview these people it's really a public service you know what i mean it, mm -hmm. it, it really provides a lot of insight into uh their story and then you know we just put it out there and and people can dissect it or interpret it or you know uh hate on it or and they did feel it uh any way they wanted so that's really what um, I was trying to do, and I did some of this in the Malfunction show, and it was a big response as well, mm -hmm. because I think people, it's in our face, but a lot of people aren't really comfortable to at, roll down the window and say, "Hey, what's what's your deal?" or you know, "What's your what's your story?" So that was really what I wanted to do was just kind of like take a little snapshot of um, what's going on with these guys. And with Henry, I mean, he's right around the corner here, and we see him a lot, and he's got the sign that says homeless veteran. There's another guy, uh, Frank, a guy in a wheelchair who mm -hmm. also says he's a homeless veteran. Who Henry referenced a couple times in right. the interview. Yeah, so um, people talk about veterans this, veterans that, and it just kind of like <sighs> hit me to see, like, we have two homeless veterans on Guam. I mean, it's not just something you uh, hear about in the States mm -hmm. anymore. It's hitting home, and I thought it was interesting that Henry was telling us that he was flown out here on one basically like a one way ticket. And since you did those interviews, this is something you're actually looking into. And, you know, when you hosted uh, our live stream on Facebook Live right. for starting lineup, you were talking with uh, Diana. Yeah. Diana Calvo. Uh, right. Margaret. Oh, I'm sorry. Mar Margaret. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Tori uh, Uchima. Right. Yep. Yeah. With the Guam Homeless Coalition. And you and it was interesting when you actually brought up the fact that they're like, you know, there was these big rumors. And back in the old Guam cable TV days in the early 90s. There was this myth that I don't know if anyone definitively proved that the government of Hawaii was actually giving some of their homeless a one-way ticket out here right. to kind of like offload them. And when you brought that up with Margaret, she said it's true. Yeah, it took her a while to get yeah. around to it though. Yeah. She, you could tell it was an it was a dicey subject with her. Yeah, she was well, kind of uncomfortable. I mean, how true is it is that they they actually. Um, are in the process of raising funds to buy uh, tickets uh, back to California for this woman and her children who ended up on Guam. And according to Margaret, this woman has no idea how she ended up. Um, there might be some mental health issues at, at play there, but um, she doesn't know how she got here. So 
it's not just an urban legend it's fact right so uh, margaret works with the homeless coalition and they're sending this woman and her children back to california uh so people do i don't know if it's judges or if it's you know um city or state governments that are sending uh, homeless people to Guam. But she brought a really uh, good point because they said, oh, why Guam? And in the case of Henry, he was sleeping in Jersey where, I mean, you know, temperatures are freezing right now. And she mm-hmm. says, oh, they send people to Guam because year round growing season, you know, I mean, we've got beautiful weather out here. And uh, so at least for their own physical health, if they're going to have to sleep out in the streets, better to do so in a tropical climate where you're not going to get. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand the mindset, you know, yeah, no, where, mean, you, where you can't get, you know, um, any number of illnesses just because you're in the bitter cold right yeah so it's like they, they look around and say oh where can we send them that's a u.s territory that you know they're not going to freeze to death hmm oh guam yeah skip hawaii send them straight to guam. so is it literally they just give them a hot shower i don't a hot, know a hot meal and put them on a plane and then know. just say you know not our problem anymore maybe not a shower <laughs> yeah that's that's true okay so i want to talk about something because about henry so many of the comments people seem seem to say you know i've I've driven by the Harmon McDonald's. You know, I've, I've personally, I've even seen him as far as um, uh, Ocapelas over in Tamuning. I mean, right. he, he gets there on foot. And speaking of which, I know he did have an injury. I believe he twisted his ankle. He broke, you know, broke his leg something. or something like that. Yeah. Um, but by all accounts, according to our comment stream, people were saying he's very mild-mannered. He's very humble. Um, he's very cool. In your interview, he was obviously very... Agitated. Yeah. W- was yeah. it just because the camera was on him, or you just caught him on a bad day? Or, I and think how, how was that for you doing the interview? Because, I mean, you know, he said, he goes, man, I want to choke somebody right now, and you're the closest person to him. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just that... Uh feeling that I've gotten used to over the years. I've, I've, you know, a lot of people have wanted to choke me. Uh, mostly women. Um, if you're into okay. that kind of thing, you know, hey, <laughs> let, no, your, I, let your freak flag fly, man. I mean, I, I don't, I think we caught him on a bad day because he was saying a lot of stuff about his ex-wife that, you know, we had to take out of the, um, the original interview. And, uh, I did hear from people say, Oh yeah, you know, I talked to him and he was, he was mild mannered or like you said, but, uh, he was anything but mild mannered. And you forced him to go to a very dark place. Maybe I didn't force him anywhere. I said, Hey, do you want to do an interview? And, okay. and at first he was like, Oh, I don't really know. I'm not really feeling like talking to anybody. But then eventually he was like, you know, okay, fine. And he just went off on that tangent about, it. I mean, obviously he's going through a lot and that's what kind of, uh, cracked me up about some of the comments is people were like, why is he so angry? Well, I'm pretty sure if you were out there, you know, living on the streets or whatever his situation is, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily have a smile on your face all the exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. That's a very good point. Okay. Well, um, what did you learn as a journalist from interviewing, doing both of those interviews and, and maybe more to the point, two part question, like what can we as, as fellow Guamanians do to help these people? Because, you know, we, we don't leave, we don't leave our neighbors behind out here. Yeah. I think what, what, what we can do, one of the first things we can do is stop the butt, you know, um, if you read a lot of these Facebook comments, people are like, yeah, I want to help, but, or, you know, yeah, they're probably hard up, but, you know, or, oh, man, you know, yeah, maybe they're legit, but these other guys were at the game room. I mean, people just, uh, to me, they, it's a two-part answer to our question. First of all, I think people are so eager, to, so eager nowadays to just tear people down. Like, we put up this interview with Homeless Henry, and in the first couple of comments are like, oh, he's a fake, or oh, it's, you know, people just want to, even with a couple I interviewed, there were comments where like, oh, yeah, whatever, they're, they're BSing, or, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like people are jaded and cynical, and they, they've been lied to so many times that they don't really want to believe in anything. I think that's also the outrage culture of just YouTube and Twitter and everything. And everybody, yeah. every, everybody's just looking for any excuse to snark on somebody. Well, I think they're just looking for an excuse to not do anything about it. You know what I mean? That's what I mean I'll, by the I'll whole butt, butt mentality. Yeah, well, you know, I would give them money, but may, they're probably going to go buy may, beer. May I ask a question, Chris? Sure. Certainly, Uncle Ken. Why, why is it so intriguing that uh, because Henry came out? Is it because he's a veteran? Why is it so intriguing that we interviewed this guy and or you interviewed this guy? And what made me want to interview yeah. him is that a he was a veteran and b it was um, kind of obvious that he wasn't you know native to Guam. And yeah, so I, I wanted well, to find out the, like where did he come from and how to get here and okay. you know the, what's his the story. The point that I'm trying to get to is that it doesn't say much for our 
veterans or how the veterans were being treated because worldwide, internationally, actually, uh, seemingly that the veterans are not really being paid much attention to these days from the survivors of Asian Orange to those other folks that are just like, well, you serve our country, you retire, you're a veteran, that's it. And uh, that, that, you know, the source way, way back uh, uh, since the end of the Vietnam War, uh, there's some sort of... Um, indifference against our veterans there and our right. government, our federal government. And you can empathize government. with this because you I are, empathize, you are a veteran. I am a veteran yeah. and stuff like right. this. But yeah, the intriguing part is that Henry is a veteran, uh, number one, and he's in this position over here and it's not from here. But I was just wondering uh, during that interview, it doesn't really say much about how our people in VA are uh, taking handle of this thing to right. uh, I mean, in really their do defense, something about their homelessness. Ken, the day that interview uh, dropped on Facebook, the same day uh, there was a veterans outreach uh, guy from the local veterans affairs office that came here to KUAM. Uh, I think his name was Victor, and he was looking for me to find out where he could find Henry because they saw the interview and um, they wanted to go out and, and you know kind of see what services, if any, he qualified for. Or And I think there was some debate That's about probably whether... probably West Care, which is not even an arm of the Veterans Association. Or no, this guy, he arm. left his card, and it was a veterans uh, okay. thing. Yeah, no, I mean... Interesting. It, so the word got around, obviously, and, and the impact yeah, was made. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, Ken definitely has a point. With, like, And this goes back to what I said earlier. Is like people talk all day about, oh, the veterans, oh, yeah, we, thank you for your service. But, uh, you know, you talk to any veteran in Guam about services, and they're going to end up, you know, talking your ear off for an hour about how they could all be – the services could all be better. Okay, now when you did these interviews, you know, you're just, you're doing your job. You know, you've got your game face on, and you're, you're, tr- you're trying to be, you know, very – very objective you don't want to like you know let your heartstrings be tugged because you're trying to tell a story right you do though i mean how could you not have your heartstrings tugged when you're just hearing um interviewing these people and so that's my question to you yeah. when, when when you hit stop on your iphone stop recording it and everything like that where do you go from there as, as a human not not as a journalist not as a guamanian but as a human being as what, a human being yeah right. right as a human a member of the hum- humanity um, I don't wait till I stop recording. I feel it when it happens. You know, I mean, in, in Henry, Henry's situation, um, you know, uh, obviously one of the takeaways from that interview was that he wants to see his daughter. You know, he's been di- he's divorced, uh, whatever. I was able to glean that he's having custody issues. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So as someone who who's uh, divorced as well and someone who's gone through, you know, child custody things. It's hard to deal with, and I could understand why he would, uh, you know, be upset and it just, you know, caught him on the bad day or maybe it just all came crashing down on him. I mean, he's not in the best situation. Uh, With the couple, that was in a way more frustrating because uh, it's really disturbing to me. And not to say that, you know, a Chamorro homeless person is any uh, better than a Chamorro person or a non-Chamorro homeless Mm -hmm. person, but you look at the stats, I mean, Chamorros are the we're the biggest uh, number of um, the homeless population in our own island. For all you know, you may be closely related to them. Yeah. They're Perez's and Camachos, so those are, those are big families, yeah. you know what I mean? And I know some pretty well-off Perez's and Camachos. Uh, but to, to interview this couple and to find out that they're trying to go through the system, they're trying to get a job, they're trying to get services from Gov Guam, but... It's just not happening. They just get run around. And, and, um, you know, the young lady talked about riding the paratransit and how unreliable it was. And uh, people talk about and hate on uh, these homeless people. And they say, oh, you know, get a job, you bum. Well, here we have a prime example of two people who are trying to get a job. And the government's supposed to hold up its end of the deal, and it's not. And so that's what that's what really sucks as not just someone who's interviewing these people but as a viewer as a consumer of the news uh, products it it hurts me to know that hey uh, we got this you know big bad government here and they can't do anything to help these people and you're really hearing it if you go interview like for example the director of dissid i don't even know if they have a director but that's one of the points uh the young man brought up was like hey over at dissid they don't have a director uh they just kind of do whatever they want well if you call dissid you're going to hear a whole other story like oh yeah we got we're helping everybody you know Mm -hmm. so i really like that you really get an insider's perspective from from somebody who actually needs these services and and i mean you watch that interview it's clear that this young couple and they're young i mean they're young people and i was actually amazed when 
when we were putting that you know that live stream together for you when you turned the camera on the woman because you had told me before hey bro i interviewed like a man and a woman i had no idea that the woman in the wheelchair her leg had recently been amputated i mean you can still see the you know the scars and the stitches sorry about that on her knee. yeah no i mean yeah. that was, it was unbelievably telling but yeah. I, I had no idea she was that young well she's diabetic and so she lost her uh, limb because of uh, diabetes and so th- that interview there were just so many different cross sections of issues that are going on in guam i mean uh you have the homelessness issue you have uh you know that these people are young you have that they're tomorrow you have that the government that's supposed to be helping them is you know uh giving them the the run around and you know strangling them with red tape and then you have the the issue of you know uh, diabetes i mean striking a you know big majority of the population here so i really felt like it was a loaded interview because there were so many things that you know i watched the interview five six times and each time i took away something different from it you know so. well we want to know what you take away from those interviews certainly a lot to unpack both emotionally and visually so check out our youtube channel right now youtube.com slash kuam news to see both of chris's interviews uh, with henry the homeless person here in Harmon, um as well as the couple down in higanya and if you're on our YouTube channel, segueing into the next part of this interview, you can also see another long-form interview that Chris did with a certain gentleman in our community who I would say, Chris, if you had even brought up the notion of you interviewing former Governor Carl T.C. Gutierrez 10, 15 years ago, hell would have frozen over before you, <laughs> got, you got face-to-face time with, with the Gov. Yeah, and I talked what about that. that like? I talked about it in my podcast where people kind of assume that um, – you know, me and Carl Gutierrez have this, like, hateful relationship where we see each other and it's just like, you know, but it's not even like that. I mean, uh, Carl's old school. I mean, he's used to the media criticizing him. So oh, there was that. And then it was he funny. It. Yeah. he gets, So but during the interview, he kept talking about the media created this narrative about me that I'm crooked, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I totally know. That he's got to be talking about me. You know, I'm not the only one, right? So at the end of the interview, we stop rolling. Because your song, Mr. Governor. Yeah, so we're packing skit. up, and he's like, yeah, it's you, man. You know, you're the one with that narrative, boy, that Mr. Governor, Mr. Governor, you know. So, <laughs> But every yeah. time I've seen you, like, approach Carl, especially in the time that you've become, you know, like, you're, you're covering hard news now. The first right. thing you always do is you always go in, I'm an uh, Yeah. You, you still address him as governor as if he was the sitting chief executive. So... Is, I is, mean, he, is, kinda, he respect, is he receptive, that, that kind of respect? Yeah, I mean, you know, he is everybody's uncle, if you think about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a Titan, and the Titan is related to everybody. And somehow, through my grandmother, he he's my uncle down the line somewhere. But, you know, it's more of a, a respect thing because he's older. And, uh, and about calling him governor, I mean, you know, if I see uh, – Governor Eddie Calvo, I'm going to call him Governor or Governor Joe Atta. Just, sure. It's just something for some reason. I don't know if it's just Guam, but they hold that title. Even if I see a, somebody used to be a senator, I'll usually say, oh, senator. So, no, I mean, uh, people mix up that I like to critique and criticize. And, you know, I did a lot of things with sarcasm and satire. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm a disrespectful person. It's mm-hmm. just like you got to separate what you do and how you critique someone's like professional life and you know how you treat them personally because yeah i mean i did songs about guitars we did so many skits about guitars but at the end of the day i mean that's talking about his performance and capacity as an elected leader what is your relationship with carl guitars like now like if, if you saw him in church if you ran into him at at the supermarket yeah we'd be like hey what's up cool i have his number we you know if i do stories i always send them out to uh, people like uh, Governor Gutierrez, you know, and just just put him out there and see what people think. So I'll send him stories, and he'll shoot back like, "Oh, hey, good story." It's funny with that that interview I did. So we posted the whole interview, but the story that ran on on uh, our KUAM uh, newscast was more about him being a special assistant and him having a staff and him having a budget, which is something we've never seen any special assistant uh, a special assistant have before and if anybody could do it it would be uh, governor car Gutierrez who could do that i mean that's how <laughs> i don't know if you want to say that's how slick he is or what but he is a savvy government employee I right mean, yeah know, before he gets to the point of like being the speaker of the legislature the governor you know i mean so you know aspirations about him being congressman at one point and everything like that but i mean he knows the system he does and the, the day i interviewed him was the day that uh the family viewing uh, was held for his brother uh, ralph 
Mm-hmm. And the next day was a funeral. So uh, that was a Thursday. Story aired on Thursday. I got a text from him around like six. Like he was like, oh, hey, I, I just came from the family viewing. Hey, can you send me the, the report from tonight? And so while well, I interviewed him for 45 minutes and he talked about all the things he wants to do with Gita, the, the specific focus of that story was, hey, he's got a staff. Hey, he's got a budget. Hey, he's going to rent an office outside of Adeloup. Hey, he's the chief advisor for this and that, but the governor's other chief advisor doesn't have any of that stuff. So that was kind of the gist of the story. So I sent it to him, and I thought to myself, like, man, this guy just got done going to a family viewing for his brother. And so he he got the story. I got the two blue check marks, and then I saw the typing, and I was like, oh, here we go. Because I thought for sure he's going to be like, what the hell? You mm-hmm. took everything out of context, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, wow, nice piece, thumbs up, and a little blow kiss emoji. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, he was like, yeah, good story, boy, good story. And I was like, oh, I thought you would get mad. And he was like, why? And it was just funny because everyone else that I know who watched that story, they were like, oh, Carl, oh, why is he involved? They were just so pissed about him having that level of power in the Leon Arts and Ori administration. But to him, he was almost oblivious to it. You well, know? I remember you and I, we were talking and you're like, man, I got so much good information on this and yeah. so little of it is going into the story. I was like, why don't right. we put up the whole thing? Yeah. So that's what, I mean, to be fair, we did want to put up the whole uh, interview. But and I you just, said a part of it is he actually addressed how many haters he has. You, yeah. you wrote that part specifically. Yeah, yeah. And so I just thought it was he's cool. Aware of that. It was cool that he didn't have a problem with the story, but I don't know if that was more like he just, uh, because he said some things in there that were kind of like, huh? Like, you know, he said, oh, he's not going to run for governor, but he's going to make Lou and Josh so successful. You know, he's never been one to shy away from giving himself credit. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> we saw that. And so I thought he would have a problem with the interview but then when he ended up saying like oh wow great story yeah good job you know i was just kind of like okay because everyone else was like how did he get back in you know you know i've only interviewed carl i believe in the 20 years i've been here at KUM. i've only interviewed him three times and i've told like new reporters coming in there's only one person that i've ever interviewed that you really have to prepare for and you really have to you know have your a game that day because he, he has a lot of stuff and yeah. he has a lot of telepresence right. he's the camera loves him he yeah. knows how to work a room if you're in a public environment yeah and as soon as you walk in there you can tell he's going to look you up and down yeah and say you know does is this person nervous at all and everything and, but I, I think your point was you did your job the, to the very best of your ability you didn't back down on some parts and he's going to respect you for that yeah and that's degree. that's the thing is like you know he people make assumptions about he's a tough interview he is and he has so much knowledge but you know he's always going to say those things that carl guterres says that kind of make you scratch your head or that you think hey if another politician said this people would just be like well but if you know uncle carl says it, it's like oh okay you know so (laughs) i mean he's uh, definitely a force in guam politics you know like it or not okay so that that very easily lets us segue to the third act of our three-act play right now is is the style of your storytelling over the course of your career as a as a broadcaster, as a communicator, you know, you, again, I first became aware of you because we're roughly the same. I mean, you're a year older than I am in school. You went to GW, I went to Sanchez, but, but I started following this mop headed guy that was, that was writing for PDN's sports department called CB Barnett. Who I had no idea who he was always had, like his, his byline in the, in the PDN always had a Phillies cap on. And could really, really write a baseball story. And as, as, as a sports guy, I always appreciated your sports writing. I became a fan of yours. Really good stuff. Um, well, I think I had a lot of freedom to write the way that I wanted to write. And I just didn't, you know, sports, I mean, now there's just so many time constraints. But especially a sport like baseball, it just lends itself to storytelling. So, mm. I mean back then there was always a lot of space to fill so i was but, able to, you know i got to embellish a lot so. but you and, and because it is sports which is kind of like a little bit on the lighter side as right. opposed to like hard news you know yeah. car crashes and you know arrests and things like that you always had this air of keeping things whimsical and then that lets you get into you know adopt the malfunction persona which and you did you did sta- you did you literally did stand-up comedy for a number of years and then that was your your radio person how did you adopt that personality and you know how did you how did you find your voice your comedic voice. I didn't find it. It's always here. It's okay. here right now with us. Um, when I was growing up in my family, and every family's got that comedian that, you know, makes everyone laugh. The one that you're having a barbecue and they call you, hey, Cristobal, come over here, do grandma's voice, do grandpa's voice. So ever since I was young, that's how I did it. And, you know, we really wanted to give Guam something that it didn't have at that time. Because when I was coming up, 
people would listen to like Hawaiian stuff, Hawaiian jokes, Hawaiian skits, and they would obviously relate because we're Islanders and they're Islanders. But I really wanted. I would always think like Frank DeLima, you're talking about, yeah, like who yeah. who does that on Guam? Who you know what I mean? And there were there are a lot of like Sus Tremoro did funny things. I mean Tony Lamorano. A lot of people don't know that he used to do stand up and hosting and stuff. I didn't so know that. I'm not saying like. It was something new that started. It was just like it wasn't put in a format where you could, you know, really access it. And so that was kind of what we wanted to do was, like, give Guam something. Because, you know, when I was younger, 20-some years ago, a lot of people on Guam were really looking outward for everything. You know, we were looking uh, at the States, at Hawaii, at all these other places to get inspiration. And I'm really proud and happy that uh, now all these years later, and we're looking at each other for inspiration and we're looking mm-hmm. uh you know to this island um you know for people that do great things for you know, art culture comedy media we really are our, our sense of like self-worth in my opinion has uh, really increased over the last few decades and it's cool it's like we're living in a a chamorro renaissance right now and it's interesting because the, the whole malafunction again the persona that you created it, it became a brand you did merch you had CDs out. I mean, it was it was this you know it was this business idea, but also a lot of people really glommed onto it. And I believe because people, a great number of people, really thought that they could empathize with you, and they were like, "Hey, you know, he's one of us. He's not like a Chamorro comedian who comes from a extremely well-to-do family, and he lives in Jonestown, and you know, like all of this stuff. like." That was me. Like I went to school with that guy, even if it wasn't you directly. I, mean, right. I, I know, I know who he is, and he gets what I'm going through. But I was always shy, so people who went to school with me, they would run into me like, "Man, I had no idea you like to like talk about stuff or joke." Because I was always really shy. I mean, I was always thinking stuff in my head, but I am shy. I mean, radio is a, a career for shy people, but um, I couldn't survive, and we couldn't survive. We couldn't feed our families just doing radio. You know what I mean? Just doing a four-hour shift inside a little room really had to find a way to, you're right, make it a brand, but not not just a brand, to make it something that, you know, can last forever. And I think that's, you know, I was fortunate to work with so many great people uh, in my career. And I feel like, um, oh, yeah, yeah, there's one over here. (laughs) One of them's right here. (laughs) No, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you could go into radio and you could do a four-hour shift and you could be a DJ, but uh, my goal was always to be an entertainer, you know? That's just something I always wanted to do, and I felt like uh, there was just so much more possibility okay, if, now, if we became entertainers, you know? Now, the chronology of this is you were very, very successful doing the comedy thing. Um, I, how long have you been at KWM now? 10 years? 11? 15 15, years. okay. Yeah. yeah, clearly I've been keeping tabs. <laughs> but I remember when you came over and they were like, hey, Chris Barnett's coming over. I was like, okay, wow. Our our game is just taken to the next level because we got... Not, oh, and thanks. Not, it was you. It was Julius Santos. Yeah, it was and Andy. Andy right. the, the whole trifecta. Yeah, yeah. And each of you has your... I mean, you were all three... Kind of like, like a boy band. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you each had your own thing. You were yeah. more... You know, you weren't afraid to go after people using comedy as a vehicle andy was the white guy yeah andy was kind of like you know all self-deprecating and julius was the the hot one was the ladies man yeah <laughs> he still combs his hair and that's like, it's crazy <laughs> i was how his hair is saying that he's right. 25 years old um but then when the news department began to work you into the fold you know you did uh, sports for about a year and a half and now you're doing hard news i can't imagine that having to not give up but you know change your voice from someone who's always looking for you know to drop the punchline and have right. comedic timing and everything like that to now being someone who tells a story right and tells it you know from both perspectives and you know and is very objective and everything how difficult a transition was that i could I, never do that i don't think it was that difficult of a transition because i feel interesting i mean well you know i'm maybe you're just that damn good no i just feel like i you know it wasn't like it was strictly knock knock jokes or you know uh, strictly like hee hee ha ha like we'd call it uh, jokes I think over the course of the 20 years that you know we were doing it there was a lot of like stuff that wasn't even really funny but you know sometimes when you say something that's true it makes people laugh but there I was think point since, in social commentary I mean, look, look at Mr. Governor right Mr. Governor is actually the a political and social equivalent of a hard news story but it's you know it's mm-hmm. comedic but it's very i mean if you look at the lyrics it's a scathing um 
but now it's just almost. A, yeah. Uh, you that, know, was, that was you snarking on the governor. But yeah. And so I did that, the music. <laughs> you know, through how, how many years is malfunction. So, yeah, we would do prank calls and, yeah, we would do, you know, the hee hee ha ha stuff. But there was always uh, things about current events, which is something that I've always been a fan of, always been into the news cycle. And, you know, so over the years, we always were talking about things like that. So when I started doing news, to me, it was just kind of a natural evolution. And I was tired of getting up early in the morning. And, you know, when, when I was I did a. Um, a nine episode run of uh, the malfunction show, but it was more like social and political issues. And I found myself after a few episodes, I'd look at, you know, and putting the show together, I'd be like, okay, now I need to find something funny because it's all serious and there's nothing funny and people are expecting me to be funny. So at that point it was like being funny was almost not becoming a burden. Um, because I love to make people smile and laugh, but it was becoming like an afterthought, you know what I mean? Where I'd put in this 30-minute show and I'd have like 20 minutes of, you know, interviewing homeless people or, you know, talking about stuff at the legislature. And then I'd be like, oh, I need something funny to put in here. And I just felt like it was a natural evolution where instead of uh, doing all this work and trying to find a way to, to... put a little funny icing on top i might as well just do the work and that's the same i uh, think but i'll tell you you know like doing a song or a skit it's a lot more uh you have a lot more freedom and leeway you know like mm-hmm. a comedian or a satire um, a person who does satirical things i mean it's free reign to say whatever you want as long as you you know try and make it funny you don't have to prove anything you don't need documents you know so it's a lot easier to do uh comedy and you know current events jokes and stuff than it is to do hard news but i think that's they're also very interesting similar. That, yeah. that you say that because i i know some people that you know are are professional actors or, or even some people that are you know like long time tenured journalists and, and they said i could never even do comedy because again the timing of it you know being able to to crack it to crack the right kind of joke i mean it's hard could, yeah a, a joke can completely go haywire on but you i think it's totally hard when sideways. you when you overthink it you know i mean people are always like oh how do i do that yeah, just, just be natural i mean when has a joke ever backfired on you i think i'm fortunate you know especially with this trend nationally where people are looking back at people's body of work i mean there's like jokes i told you know 10 years ago that if we were to tell them nowadays it would be like oh, oh my yeah. god they're gonna string us up on the street light you know again so. the outrage culture it's like <laughs> Yeah. You, you would automatically be labeled as I mean, and I'm not right. I'm not no. citing any particular joke, but a racist, he's a or racist, a sexist, a sexist or, misogynist, right. all you know. of this. But you know, I think comedy needs to be a safe space, and I, I, my opinion on on the whole outrage culture and and you know everyone getting offended by uh, everything is you know. Um, the comedy, whoever does comedy, you know, we're not forcing it down anyone's throats. It's here, and you come you come to the jokes. You come to the comedy, right? So uh, when you go watch a comedian, you should know that part of what comedians do is to try to make you laugh about things that aren't necessarily funny. And I think that that's the gist of it. And if you go back, I mean, who were people that, you know, did things that we remember forever? They're, you know, com- Shakespeare. I mean, you know, what mm. wasn't he a comedian? Uh, you know, jesters in Among the other things, court, right? Yeah. So, um, I and we've known each say, other yeah. forever, and I've, yeah. I've never heard you actually break down the, the like the art of comedy like this. Because I don't think it's an art. I think it's just something that you just. I, I don't know. You either have it or you don't, you know, and I never really tried to work really hard at uh, it. I mean, but that doesn't mean like everything. Obviously, I put out some stuff that wasn't funny or, you know, the things I think that backfired was when I would step away from what I felt, you know, um, was working and that you want to challenge yourself. But sometimes, you know, I do something and I think it was really funny, but it would end up like not translating to other people. So we're like, OK, let's go tell the Zori joke. Mm-hmm. You know How do you I mean? come so, up with all your catchphrases? Because there, there was a point where almost everything you would say would become what's now known as trending and that would that was pre-twitter everything like that. every time like the hee hee ha ha the right. malfunction stuff you know yeah. um mr governor every time you would do something that, that would really get into the lexicon of with young people especially like on guam and every everyone would be like okay they'd repeat that for like the next two months you- yeah but i mean a lot of that stuff like you know uh, i didn't even come up with it was just stuff you would hear you know like the the one um Palaxi to the maxi, you mm-hmm. know, stuff like that. I mean, people still say it nowadays, and it's funny. Uh, and they credit you. Or they just don't know where... Because now there's a whole new generation. I mean, I've been off of radio for, I want to say, like five, six years. So now we're, I'm starting to see the first generation of 
kids coming up who didn't like grow up with me on the radio and it's like i go to elementary schools and they won't even know who i am which is really refreshing because there was a point where like we'd go to you know a middle school and they were, ah, they'd oh, be screaming you, like you crazy. guys have no idea yeah. every time we get we get like these solicitation letters for you know career days and everything like that we want malafunction right yeah but now that i haven't been on the radio which is interesting because radio is a daily thing every day you got it and that's one of the things i really love about radio it's like every day is a new day you can wake up you know today go in there put on your best show and guess what you got to do it all over again tomorrow Mm -hmm. you know so but it's also in the way that social media is ever present the time that i did radio it was ever present like you know i mean uh i went out right when all of the apps and you know spotify and pandora and all all the social media like we're so huge on social media that was really on the rise so the immediacy of radio was really what attracted me to it and just having that opportunity to, to be in people's lives like every single day all right well where can people find you on social media speaking and now we've gone from recency to immediacy recency yeah i'm everywhere i'm you all over it. yeah i still got a lot of my uh, malfunction stuff up on my uh, facebook that's official malfunction uh in instagram uh at malfunction twitter at malfunction and um you know i still got opinions you know sometimes people try and say oh how can you do the news if you have opinions but I really think it's it's pointless to pretend that because people work in the news or work in the media that they shouldn't or don't have opinions. I think it's the exact opposite. Like the more time you spend in the media digging up stuff, you know, looking at documents. I mean, how can you not form an opinion about what mm-hmm. what goes on? So this whole myth of the objective a journalist who, you know, unbiasedly is that a word? Unbiased. It is now. <laughs> Reports the news that I don't think that's. I don't know why to anything. You just, yeah. you just inherently make it a gerund. <laughs> you know, we look at the recency of it now. It's like people. You look at what? Okay, CNN, uh, Fox News. Like these people definitely have opinions, and I think it's always been that way. I think the media has always had an opinion. They've always had a, you know, a story to tell, a side to take, and it's kind of ridiculous to to think that you know. The media doesn't have opinions. Most of the time, we just you know have to keep it to ourselves. But I've never been that way. All right. Okay. Well, final question right now, and we'll let you wrap up because we have some storytelling that we have to do. Um, has age tempered your character? And so my my question to you is, how how different, if at all, is the Chris Barnett today from the Chris Barnett ten, fifteen, twenty years ago? Well, professionally, I'm I'm definitely where I want to be. Uh, You know, I feel like I've turned the page on and I don't want to disappoint anybody, but, you know, I feel like I've turned I've I feel like I did everything I could do as malfunction, you know, and and there was a point where I wasn't questioning it, but it became and only in the last few months, it became a job. You know what I mean? And that's that's the and no offense to everybody who's got jobs out there, but, you know, I did it for 20 years. Right. I I gave you guys (laughs) no offense to any of us who have to pay taxes. Right. (laughs) I feel like I really left it all out there on the field. You know what I mean? I mean, do you feel that there was an alter ego that was kind of like separating who? who yeah, you really? okay. of course. I mean, you know, I'm, Alice Cooper went through the same thing when he was, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, I was putting on a show. Yeah, but I mean, and part of that was because you got to be entertaining. You got to stay relevant. I think that's something we're really successful at is like you saw like in radio even. I mean, that's why you couldn't just be a DJ. I mean, in my opinion, if you want to last long in radio in Guam, don't just be a guy who punches the clock and does a four hour show. You got to like make people talk about you outside of that, Mm -hmm. that shift. And so we saw people come and we saw people go and we stuck around. And so I feel like I was able to turn the page on that. And now this is kind of what I want to do. It's way different. Uh, You know, two, three years ago when I went somewhere, people were happy to see me. Now I show up with, you know, the microphone and a camera and they're like, Oh, you know, so it's definitely a different vibe, but I think personally, I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. And I feel like, you know, as people come up to me all the time, like, hey, what are you going to do some jokes? Or, hey, you know, uh, are you going to do any of this? Are you going to do that? And I always tell them, like, hey, you know, I, I put it all out there. It's on social media if you guys want to go back and look at it because I still feel like it's timeless. You know what I mean? You're, you're going to always have malfunction to go to. And, you know, I mean, maybe one day down the road, um, I just what's that they say never say never yeah well I gotta tell you the most viewed uh, video ever on the KUM News YouTube channel 
is a malfunction skit called Are You Guamanian or Are You Chamorro? Right, yeah. By orders of magazine. That thing still gets views today. Yeah, and that's one of those six, things six that... Six and a half million views, and you did that like what, It's a legit argument, ago. right? Are we Guamanians or are we Chamorros? And at the yeah. time I did that, all the politicians started saying Guamanians, which had the Chamorros feeling excluded. And I felt like it's one of those things where... You could even do a news story on that. Mm. Like, are we Guamanian or are we Chamorro? But, you know, it's a lot easier. What's that? A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And, mm. you know, I feel like I ran out of sugar. You, you watched uh, <laughs> Mary Poppins recently, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what happens when you've got, you know, a bunch of right. kids. Hey, thanks uh, for this chat. Good chat. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, clo- we'll close with this and everything. Because going back to, that, like, how respectful you are about your Chamorro roots and as, as just a Guam citizen, when my father died uh, a year ago, last uh, January and everything, one of the first WhatsApp messages I got what's from you at one in the morning and you're like hey bro if you need anything yeah. me and Issa are here yeah. from you and, and yeah. you know what I always remember that and I always appreciated that so of course, man. thank you man of course. you were one of the first people that reached out to me in that oh thanks yeah so thank you okay Chris Barnett one of the many people we have here in the cast and crew of KUM <laughs> and he's walking right up you know, exit, exit stage left he's obviously yeah. got stuff to do but uh, thanks so much for watching and listening to us uh, if you're listening to us on the KUM Podcast Network we are on SoundCloud and we have many many shows that we would greatly appreciate you guys check out because it's really entertaining really informative and really a lot of fun so make sure to subscribe rate and review us if you're on itunes if you're viewing us on youtube please subscribe to our channel because we have tons of stuff that you are really going to enjoy we'll see you next week for reporters journal i'm jason salas for uncle ken and all of us here take care and bye-bye